Hi everyone, I'm James Haskell and welcome to What a Flank. And now, today's guest is a, well, he spent 14 years uh, of military service. He's been four years in the Parachute Regiment, 10 years in the SAS, two Everest summits. <sighs> I've got a bit of a man crush on him. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's Jay Morton. Hi, mate, how's it going? You well? Yeah, good, thanks. Mate, you've just got that whole, like, just exude professionalism i love it like likewise i'm like, sitting no, across no, you you've no, got no. the same thing going on we've got a little bit of a no, but you're, you're looking athletic like at any moment you could break into some sort of burpee slash scaling a building maybe break a few necks and, and get out of the building you've got to stay like that though haven't you it i like doesn't, it. it doesn't leave you what doesn't leave you my um my my mum's brother once said that when he got so fit he used to walk on the uh on the balls of his feet, he reckons one day someone's going to mug him, and um, they thought he was like ex special forces. I just was like, "What are you fucking talking about, mate?" That's crazy. You're that's, cra- that's a crazy person. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, I, was yeah, like, yeah. I was like, I was like, Ma, I was like, said to he probably listened to this actually. My, it's Uncle Michael. I apologise, Michael, but you're <laughs> not, Uncle you're not spe- crazy, Uncle Michael. You're not special <laughs> forces. Um, I've got a confession to make, mm-hmm. and I, t- I told you off air because we started. We you know we obviously haven't met before. We sort of bonded in the, the green room slash the recording room. My entire childhood and everything about me was all I wanted to do was be in the SS. Does that make me a massive loser? Because I never actually did it. Oh, I don't know. Do you feel like a loser? I do feel like a loser. Because I, I, I but, but, but when I say that I like was into it, I'm talking about I had like all the BB guns. So I had like, but, like proper ones like MP5, you know, M6, all like done. I had proper like respirator, all gear, like army paint. I used to go do missions on the neighbours, plan, plan <laughs> like... Plan missions, everything else. Like it was, it was like. Pretty Why didn't you? Why, what, what happened? So uh, I, I said this to my wife yesterday. So we we, we watched that mo- new movie Tenant, right? You know, have you seen it? Yeah, yeah I've one? not seen it. I know which one you mean. Mate, made. it is a the mind. Chris Nolan one. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The visuals are incredible, but it's a complete mind fuck. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, like, I like that in a movie though. Yeah, but this is like it's going forward and back in time, and I know you can kind of vaguely work out the ones going forward and backwards because ones are running backwards and they're wearing oxygen masks, right. so they're back in time, but. Point, part, some part of it, like I really don't understand how this is this is happening. So it's one of those things I've got to watch a couple of times. Oh, this is how professional we are. We get coffee delivered. <laughs> Thank you, Orlando. Thank you. No you may retire to the other room. It's the kind of power I have. Um, no, I, I do. I never did it. I, I joined the CCF at. Um, I went to Wellington. Mm-hmm. Um, What's that? The college. Yeah, the, the CCF com- is... combined cadet force. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, no. I did you're not. Like, I did not take that. I path. can feel like you're literally <laughs> looking down your nose at me already. You're like, you're a real sad guy. Um, and, I, and I joined that, and I actually joined the marine element of that. Okay, so, so that makes it a little bit, a sli- little bit better, right? I was slightly more badass than the rest of the virgins running around. Um, and we did like, you know, night maneuvers, etc. I just, I ended up at the rugby path for no other reason. And I, and uh, my mum, I think my mum thought I'd probably get shot either by my own side or or really quite easily. Um, and I just don't think I would have the mental fortitude. I mean, you, I, I read an interview with you earlier that you basically, um, out of all the guys from your, your para regiment who went in, you were the only one who made it. Yeah, out of nine. Yeah. Um, yeah, and do you know what? Like, everyone goes on for a different reason, don't they? And, um like selections a big beast in itself it's you know probably the toughest six months that you will have done up to that date um and like you know probably one of the easiest things about selection is is quitting because they make it so easy for you they ask you every day um so you parade at like five in the morning like it could be pissing down with rain your fucking body's beaten you know you probably felt similar yourself kind of thing in training and like you you've then got to like carry on on you know, a a navigation for 24 kilometres or whatever, come in within the time limit. And they they know what they're doing. It's like, you know, does anyone want a VW? So voluntary withdrawal. And uh, you see people like fucking break. You see like body language and in their eyes and how they spoke the night before. It's like they're they're a broken soul and they'll stand up and they'll just walk out. Yeah, loads of people, especially when you go to the jungle. So you do, uh, so the first part of selections, the hills phase, which is three weeks, testing navigation over the hills. The next part is the jungle, which is six weeks, um, where you do four weeks living in the jungle, like full tack, everything. Like if we were going to go and piss and shit, we've both got to go together. I piss and shit, you watch your arcs. Same with everything that you do. Um, and that's when you really that's when you really see people break because you're living with each other, you're living in a team, you're constantly working with each other. And like, you know, you can you can you can just see it when someone fucking doesn't want to carry on the next day. It's like their body, everything. They just give off that aura of 
I'm done. And then the love next that. day, the next we, day, they, they make it easy for you. And they we don't go. have to push your shit here together, by the way. Just to let sure. you know. In case you've got, got a bit of PTSD. Like, I'd always like, I'll go to the toilet and you'll be like, you fucking do it together. What? <laughs> Two hours of fire. Where are you? <laughs> okay, we had to tell you, we had an England guy, um, who a guy called Tweety, David Sylvester. He was in the in the Marines. Um, mm. And he we first met him when he worked down in pool. And he got drunk one night in um, after we'd lost to France away in a nightclub. And he just came up to me and went, he goes, uh, uh, let me check your weapon. I was like, what? And he, goes, and, he, and he goes, let me check your weapon. I was like, okay. We gave him this imaginary gun. Right? He checked it and he was like, right. Um, he goes, get on the 50 cal. I was like, what do you mean? And he was pretending to be behind a sofa in a club. And he was like, three round bursts. Like, bup, 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 bup. I was like, what are you doing? He was like, grenade. Sounds like a weird, sounds like, do you just know weirdos? Because like, Uncle know Dave weird. is a weirdo. Yeah, this yeah. guy's Uncle even weird. Uncle Michael. Michael. Yeah, 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 Uncle Michael. He should be Uncle Dave. Tweety, to say to David Sylvester, oh, army people have cool names, like para and, and marines. Everyone else that it's like Smith, Smudge. It's yeah, like, yeah, they're always yeah, the same yeah. people. And it's like, if you've got a name that's similar to a famous person, you get their name. Yeah, right? yeah, like yeah. I, like I, if your surname's Presley, you just get called Elvis for the rest of your military career. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Also, because you know, especially with like the um, in two thousand and seven, we did. I talk about it in my book, What a Flank. We did. We did a, a load of stuff for the SBS guys, and um, obviously, when we went to turn up there, they they thought we were going to be like prima donna I think they got us thought we were going to be like football players but actually after a week they they you know they sort of warmed to us quite nicely it was quite good and we had a few people with um got good good, good nicknames and stuff like that but it was uh, it, but it's it, similar right yeah, like rugby very like similar. high level rugby special forces it's like a similar game right you go out you put your body on the line you do dangerous things you you you're training to be the best best in the world at what you do every day and like you go out and you you go to war essentially that's the same as what you do isn't it it, it is but I will say this I think you know for me, genuinely, I really I've got a real thing about like special forces people because I think you know, and this is what I want to talk to you about today is a just your journey, b some of the pers- the pursuit of excellence and performance, which is I think is similar to, to 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 some of my journey, and also some of the stuff like working in small teams. But I think people put sports people on a pedestal, and you say you know you in team talks you say we're going to war. There is a big fucking difference than running out of a warmed change room into Twickenham to beat, you know, fuck out the Welsh than there is you guys going in and doing what you have to do. Um, and I think it, it, it's odd because I don't fanboy over celebrities, but uh, we, we were talking, we won't mention name, but we've got, we've got a mutual uh, person we both knew that we were talking about before. And when I found out, you know, what he did, I was a bit like, like, wait, just, you know, like you just sit there, you just admire because you know the kind of hardship you, you had to go through to do that. And I did... Was that part of the reason you wanted to go from the Paris into the SS because you just wanted to really test yourself? Yeah, like, <clears throat> you know, it's weird you say that as well, just to jump on what you were saying. It's, um, but I, I also feel there's like a massive public, I wouldn't say misconception, but a conception of like the special forces. And it's something that we speak about, like with my SF mates or whatever. And it's, you know, we are just, just people, just like you guys probably feel like you're just, just not ordinary people that have just done chosen a different path in life and ended up you know being in the special forces it's like we still think feel and and do everything that a normal person does we just we're just in a different job role and we just you know exposed ourselves to diff- difficult things quite a lot so we just become accustomed to it or do you think hollywood's got a lot to answer yeah, for yeah yeah massively like hollywood and just i don't know it's like the special forces world is very secretive isn't it so yeah. you do that classic thing you just build stories up in your head yeah. and you you've got this I don't know, the imagination of like people just running indoors and just like, like I convinced someone the other day that I could kill him with one finger. <laughs> I reckon you probably could if you stuck it down their throat or like into I reckon I probably is pull the trigger, just shoot Always put your but... poke his eye into his head, maybe that, yeah. But it is, it's like, you know, we're just normal people, kind of. But it, it is interesting that, so, so you're saying that obviously it's not quite hyped up, so you're not all like Jason Bourne. No, I'm, but, but again, it's like, you know, like, you, you've got to think of the job role that we do and we go overseas and, and um, you know, take down take down terrorist networks. That's what, that, you know, that's one part of the job that we do and it's, so you've got to look, right, how how do how do you do that to the to the best that you can? Yeah. Don't need to kill someone with a finger. No. For sure. Because, Shame. Shame. Yeah, yeah. If, if I'm, if I'm next to, you know, a terrorist and I pull my finger out, like he's probably just going to shoot me. Yeah. Or someone else is going to yeah, shoot me. Fine, so, yeah. you know, we stack the odds in our favour. We go overseas. We use air support. We we train to be like proficient using the weapon systems that we carry. Um, we do do some some levels of like hand to hand combat. But again, you, you probably know this yourself doing the MMA stuff. You need to be doing that every single day. And it's, you can't be 
disarming bad guys with guns every single day of your right. life to get proficient at it. So it's something that's just taught that, you know, it's you're better off just teaching a bit of BJJ and a few stro- uh, strangulations because that's better than, you know, being able to, like, disarm Do all the crab magra or try to do all that consist- yeah, mad stuff all the time. Yeah, you need to train it. And it's like, if you're fucking doing hand-to-hand combat with some- someone on a mission, then something's gone seriously wrong, right? Yes, yes. That is interesting. Seriously that's, wrong. that's what people always say, though, isn't it? Because, again... That naive outside view. It's interesting you guys actually talk about it. That I, you know, because a lot of people who aren't ever been anywhere near special forces were, were like, yeah, well, you know, I would do this, I do that. If you actually ask someone who's been in there, like, if I am resorting to hand to kangle or I'm having a knife and the guy's fucking standing there with a gun, things have gone horribly wrong. If I'm here with no support and I've got no team around me, things have gone horribly wrong. It's very interesting you say it like that. Well, it's like it's like um, bodyguarding and stuff like that. Yeah. So I've done. Since leaving, I've done some bodyguarding, um, and it's like the first thing you do if 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 something goes wrong is just get them the fuck out of there. Yeah, yeah. Like you don't stand, don't fight. You've you, you've got a, you know a VIP, someone who's important, who's paying you to be there. You get them out there, and that you get them to safety. Would you take a bullet for your VIP? Yeah, <laughs> I knew you were definitely. Yes, I thought. Depends if it was Whitney Houston or not. Fuck, I not Whitney you. Houston. Who played the bodyguard? It was Whitney Houston. It was Whitney Houston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she's she. Yeah, she did. She did. Yeah, she, yeah, yeah. I think. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. R.I.P. Um, talented. Yeah, yeah, very talented. Uh, so yeah, but uh, is that part of the questionnaire? Do they sit there and they go, "Would you take a bullet?" Jay Morton <laughs> said, "You know, ten years SAS, good. Uh, look athletic, good. <laughs> Everest, excellent. Um, would you take a bullet? <laughs> and, and is there like a price attached to like what it costs if you take yeah, a bullet? They set they set you up with one of those lie detector tests as well, so you can't even lie. <laughs> I You're like sweating just. I like... love that. <laughs> Could you beat a lie detector test? I think so. Yeah. Could you? It, well, isn't it all about? Isn't it all about the, the questions or something? And I like, don't know, Jay. You're the special forces man. I haven't got lie detector tests. Only not... my wife makes me sit them, and I keep failing them <laughs> every day, every day. Um, I'm sure it's something like it's something to do with they can only ask certain questions because I don't know. I'm talking shit. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it is. They can only ask certain questions. Were you even then... in the SAS? Because <laughs> I'm supposed to be interviewing Jamie Morton later for my dad wrote a porno. Have I got you confused? <laughs> <laughs> Funny old thing, my uh, dad yeah, uh, wrote a porno. <laughs> Excellent. I was just pretending to be someone else. For someone who has trained themselves to an inch of their life, so you know, I know you said you're just human, just just people, but but when you make something a habit, you know, they talk about like ten thousand hours. When you are consistently, so you have the regular armed forces, so guys are trained to, the, but you know, when you're a para, that's fucking high level. But then you go again, you're literally mastering, mastering skills. Do you come into the real world and look at it as it is, and normal people, and just go? <laughs> Oh my god, you lot moan fucking all the time, and you're a load of fannies. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, nah, do, do you know what we live in? We live in a soft world now, don't we? Like, you can order a coffee, we can get water that you know we can drink, and it's not gonna give us the shits. Yeah, uh, like the world that we live in is very soft, and I think I'm not sure getting coffee d- d- dictates the world soft. I mean, everyone being but, offended. But the by choice, right? Yeah, yeah. The fine, choice, like fine. we could, you know, when when you go overseas and you see like. How oh, people yeah. in Africa yes. and Afghanistan. Yeah. Live. yeah, of course. It it you know, it humbles you a little yeah. bit to say, you know, there's people over there fucking they don't have water or whatever, and then we're just but yeah, um yeah, a little bit, you know, like you know, I think the, the world could benefit from being a, a little bit more resilient. Do you think do you think that um you know they ever talked about like national service? I'm interested about that because I always thought that was a really good thing, you know, like do you think that'd I be do. a good thing? Yeah. Yeah. Like but don't you think a lot of people more... are gonna dis- disagree with it, but I think if you just did a fucking year yeah. in some sort of unit where discipline was important, right? Yeah. You didn't even have to go to war. You looked after, um, you know, you, you did important jobs in the UK, whether it was looking after military bases or, you know, working in hospitals if you're a medical staff or something like that. You Building gave, shit or something. You Hopefully. gave back to a community that you're yeah. going to live in for the rest of your life. Yeah. Like, and then you might have a little bit of respect for the country that you live in instead yeah. of dropping shit on the floor and stuff like that. I did think that every time I see, you know, you go past like motorway bits and pieces and they all that rubbish and everything else Perfect. like that. And I thought, you know, even with all the recycling, you know, they said they can't manage recycling and sorting it out. If you've got people qualified discipline every day, they had to go and do something just for a year to help in and learn different skills. You come out of it okay. My concern is that it would water down what you guys did because if you make anything mainstream, imagine... When you yeah, were... but they're not going to go in the special forces, are they? No, like, not the special forces got. level, but even all my armor level. You know, when you go in there and, you, and someone says to you, "Get down and press up," she's like, oh, "I can't, my my back hurts." And you're like, yeah. you know, and you go, "Fucking shut up! Why are you swearing, you little bitch? Oh, 
you gender st- like it would just be a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, I it think it's a bit confusing. All that's what I mean. These days, that's it? what but I mean. Then I joined the army like you know, sixteen years ago. Back then, like anything went. Yeah, like people were getting punched and stuff. <laughs> but, <it was> like, <laughs> but like you didn't like you didn't complain. Like you wanted to be a fucking paratrooper. Yeah, and it's the DS, the the screws we called them. It was you looked up to them. They were your fucking role models. Yeah. You know, I left school with not much. Went into some shit jobs. Quit college. Played a bit of sport. Like they were the first like male. Alpha role models, role models yeah. that I, I saw and I wanted to be them. And if you punch me in the face, then I just, he's trying to make me tougher. I probably deserved it. <laughs> do you know, you yeah. couldn't do that now though, right? No, you couldn't. And I, it, it's one of those things because um, I don't really get, you know, get into politics. And that's not why I, I won't go down this thing. But I, I do think it's interesting because do, I, I think a lot of people in, in um, public... Ha- just haven't suffered but in any way yeah. in ter- not in, not in terms of things like bereavement and loss because everybody has shit going on i think mental health is really important but i'm talking about how much better do you feel even now you're out putting yourself with a ringer in the gym or going with a teammate and, and doing a, a a trek like i follow your instagram i see you climbing shit all the time and going up and doing stuff how much better do you feel after utilizing the one body you've got putting it through the mill and and going through a bit of pressure with a mate yeah 100 percent. like I think, you know, it's, it's it's an important message, isn't it? Like suffering, like we should all suffer more. And, um, you know, even just like, you know, everyone goes out, they do the nine to five job, they get up in the morning, they get the same fucking bus into work. They go to a job that they're not really satisfied with, are they? They're not, you know, hand on heart. They can't say that they're, they're happy in that no. job. They finish, they do the same shit, they eat the same food, they're probably overweight. And like you said, we get this one body, right? I want to I wanna still be doing the same things that I'm doing now when I'm 80 years old. Mm. Like that last day that I have on earth, like I'll be fucking running, I'll be climbing mountains, I'll be surfing. Like, do you know what I mean? But you, people just don't have that same mentality, right? Yeah. People don't want to make the most out of their life. Um, and it's, do you know, it's like, I don't know if you, if you, if you, if you find this, but I always feel with my life, you have these extreme highs, especially in the special forces. Like you go on an operation, like it's successful, you know, you bank a lot of cash, you've got an extreme high, but then that comes at like, a, like a, cost of extreme lows as well yes like and, and all those people that go out and do that nine to five job they just flatline right yeah they're just like constant they're safe they're secure they never really go up or down they never experience like what it feels like to climb everest or to you know to hold a cup up in the air or something yeah. like that they never experience that but even so just achieving get... something in terms of a physical a physical feat even if you go, you know like because you watch people go in the gym so i so i i've got, since i retired i had to get my my public gym membership that nice. was an eye-opening experience. Yeah. Uh, first of all, people haven't got a fucking clue what they're doing. Secondly, a lot of bicep curls. A lot of, bi- lot a lot of, of bad, bicep no, curls. A lot of bad bicep curls yeah. involving the hips. of like that. You're literally grating away L4-5. That's to give yeah, you dust. Yeah, yeah. Right? And you're not actually lifting the weight up, so you're swinging it up yourself. And your Terri- biceps probably aren't going to get bigger by doing bicep curls. No, no. And terrible technique. And then um, no one actually working hard. Like yeah. you see you see people do some people working hard. Yeah. But I'm talking about... And this is something I, I argue with my wife about, is that she obviously you you have to train for the goal, which I think is really important. But you know, she she basically was training and, and does kind of um, aesthetic stuff. So it's but you know, steady state cardio, moderate state cardio, some hit circuits, but not massive. Whereas I want to try and throw up in a bin by the time I've done yeah, same. Like I have to put myself yeah. in a hole because because ultimately, however ranked that session is, by the time it's done. You feel you sense of reward. You, yeah, you feel you yeah. feel amazing. You get them endorphins or whatever it is, and that sense of achievement. Same. I'm exactly the same. But isn't it funny when you go into that that gym that I feel out of place doing that? Like yes. I'm there, like grunting, like yeah. spitting, like snots going on yeah. the floor. But you're the out of place one. With the, the your kind of journey, I know what you said about wanting to, to the, you know go on from the Paris. Did you always want to be a special forces? Or was it a matter of, because I never wanted to be a rugby player, mm. but once I got into it, I wanted to be the best of what I could do. Was that similar to you or did you just always want to do that? Yeah, no, very similar. And I guess I do that now. I don't really kind of set a five-year goal and say in five years, I want to be doing this job and that job kind of thing. I'm very much the same, you know, join the military because it was something that, you know, appealed to me, like going away, traveling to different countries, being part of a team. It gives you a sense of purpose. Um so like that appealed to me and then once you start doing that and you, you become good at your craft and you've deployed overseas on operations and been in combat and you know you've, you've ticked a lot of boxes within that unit um, and then it's like right well what's next because like you want to progress like we're progressive people you want to feel like you're moving forward um, 
and it was the same with the special forces it was um yeah it was like you, you listen to people talk about it you heard stories of the guys that had came back off selection and not passed uh you've done you, you obviously know yourself what the sas is or sbs is um and yeah it's like something that you want to do again like you i never set out to be in the sas it was something that i found but i think just from you know being um being you know intrigued by by what it is and just just wanting to move forward just you just ended up there because i'm right in thinking the reason you first wanted to go for selection is you were you were on a tour and you you saw the SBS guys and they were had all like the, the sickest gear and you were like <laughs> they were the water pistol and a yeah. fucking pair of boots that disintegrated on the first sign of any problems. Yeah, we had a two thousand eight Afghan tour and um it was quite quiet. Like our first tour two thousand and six was, you know, pretty much scrapping every day, but two thousand and eight we had a different role. It was a bit quieter. Um and yeah, we, we, we were stationed where the SBS guys were in Kandahar and used to see them fly out on these two helis and uh yeah, I used to bump into them, and I don't know. It's like they've got long hair. That's what I mean. They've got yeah. presence, right? That's what I'm. That's what I'm like with, you know, when people I meet people. Because as I said, I really think our armed services are the actual heroes. NHS and armed services are like actual legit heroes. Mm-hmm. Like I fucking would always support them. I've, you know, I do. Been to SAS dinners, SBS dinners, given like shirts, come down and done whatever I can do to, to help. But there is that presence that you guys have, and then if you when you're on the outside looking in, it's just. For me, it's not because I thought you were like Ross Kemp, like super army soldiers. <laughs> I, did, yeah. I just thought, Can I not mention it? <laughs> yeah, sorry. I just think that it it's the fact I know how disciplined, how hard, and how once you were in that group, what it must have been like aspirational-wise around you, because nobody accidentally gets in, do they? Sometimes. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Do you ever sit down and you're like, fucking hell. <laughs> How have you got in this? <laughs> yeah, sometimes, yeah. Really? Um, yeah, like I don't know. It's probably I don't know. Have, have you seen it in rugby? Like yeah, where you get s- people who slip through the net, and you're like, "How the fuck did he get through?" Yeah, a load of people thought that was and me then, for like for a long part of my career. <laughs> but but the one thing is, I reckon you can steal a couple of England caps for various reasons. And then I got 70, then, 77. I think I kind of <laughs> I kind of proved that I could have like I, I was all right there. Seventy eight. You might have been fuck, mate, discovered. Shocked, you know, <laughs> James, can I have a word, please, mate? Yeah. I suppose Eddie Jones came to the first meeting. He was like, "Hess, mate." What's your grip strength like? And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, because you're just fucking hanging on there, son. And I was like, day one? I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, but you but you genuinely, people get to the net. Yeah, one or two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, do, do you know what? Like, um, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, isn't it? You get, you know, say selection has 150 people that turn up. You go to the jungle with 50 people. It's quite intimate, but, you know, one person only has to perform in one discipline and then they make it to the next discipline and, you do every every so often just get like one that slips through the through the net. And what what do you boys do about it though? A lot get kicked out. A lot get discovered. Um, so you, when you turn up to the to the squadron, you'll have a probation period of say six months to twelve months. And if that's the time when like if they're shit, you can just get rid of them. Oh, so it is another probation period, isn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I but, thought it was like once you're in. Because you get, you get once you've done selection, you get capped, don't you? And then, or, or do you, is yeah, that not badged. Badged. So you yeah. get given like the the sandy coloured, yeah. um, uh, berry and the blue stable belt. Did you ever wear just the blue stable belt and the berry? Look in the mirror and go, no. I'm fucking SS. No. You fucking did. I fucking did. You did. I would have done. You were telling me you didn't. You didn't. You're telling me that in just one quiet day. That's what we were all sat in the sauna. <laughs> yeah, but there must have been stable belts and berries just I, like that. I, yeah, mm. I've never with like beards. Yeah, I've never celebrated. Like I've never. One of my dis- you know criticisms myself was that I didn't over celebrate achievements. But there must be one moment when you sat. Wherever you happen, if you were in the garden, probably caught reflection on some sort of pool of water because you're not in, you're an outdoor man. I just pulled the bit and just went. Nah, it's weird because I found like um, when you get badged, it's a bit of an anticlimax. Oh, really? Yeah, because like you, you know, it's six months, and then at the end of that six months, you know, you, you basically get a load of people from the military. They all converge. You know, fifteen of you get through after a hundred and eighty or whatever has uh, have gone through this system. And you get given the, you know, you've, you've gone through all this shit with all these people and you've forged all these relationships and friendships. Um, and you get to the end of that, you get given a hat and a belt. Someone takes a picture of you and then you wave goodbye to all these really good mates that you've just like been a part of for the la- like the last six months. And then the next day you turn up at your squadron lines and you just, 
you kind of nobody again. Oh, really? Kind of, yeah. Like, did they treat you like because in in rugby <clears throat> we obviously like like academy guys? Did they treat you like even though you got through selection when you get in? Do the senior boys just treat you like shit? You're like, Not really. The there was there was a little bit of that maybe. Um, more so in the paras, like when you get to when you turn up at, like in, in, in the special forces, it's more just right. You're part of a team, but like you've gone through selection and you get to the end of selection and you're like you're like you've gone from nothing to like being a, a an SA, like in the SAS but then the next day you're back to square one kind yeah. of thing so you're the new bloke aren't you so yeah, it's like yeah. that massive like crescendo of right yeah. six months on selection hat and hat and belt right turn up you're a new bloke again and no one gives a fuck about that hat and belt <laughs> no no one it's like right because you've not done anything so no one gives a shit yeah and then it's it, it's a completely different world so I remember going like luckily I had a mate who's in the same squadron and um you go down to the armory and like when you're in in the green army it's like right you are weapon number 36 you have to sign it out like you have to sign a thing to say that you've got it like it's all official you can't be trusted like when i turned up i remember the first day at the ranges it was just like right we're meeting at the armory at 10 got down at the armory at 10 everyone's just running around i was just like mate uh do i have a, like do i have a weapon like where is it and my mate johnny was just like mate just grab a weapon <laughs> just, grab a, just grab a weapon they'll sort it out later no one's talking to anyone everyone's just like putting it in these black boxes because it's a different weapon system like all that kind of stuff yeah yeah and i'm like fuck it look like just did you just i just choose that one yeah and then someone else goes and grabs it you're like sorry mate <laughs> and everyone just looks dead big and old like oh cause... really and like because because obviously in the normal life, you have to have a certain level of discipline with haircuts and beards. But once you get in, everyone's just gnarly as fuck. And you must be quite skinny after the jungle stuff. Yeah, I was a runt. Yeah, I just, we, I'd literally spent the rest of the selection eating at Pizza Hut, just eating calories. So really? I had a little bit of a belly. I smashed my back up on in the jungle, so I slipped a disc, uh, carried on. So by the time I badged, I couldn't walk. Like, I was limping when I was walking. Oh. Um, and yeah, like, the troop that I went to, so I went to Mountain Troop. Um, yeah, but am I right in thinking you didn't want to go there? That was yeah, like, like yeah, the last yeah. choice. The last choice. I wanted to go mobility or air troop because I was ex para edge. So going into air troop would have been the, the done thing. And uh, yeah, like mountain troop, I was like, for fuck's sake. You're like, I sick. Like, I love mountains. And now, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah like now you love, yeah, you, now you love them. It's yeah. like the biggest dichotomy ever. But um, yeah, like my troop was just full of old blokes, like 40, 40 45. <sighs> and I passed, I was like 24 when I badged for SAS. <laughs> So I was like, this 24-year-old just like <laughs> still going through puberty. <laughs> yeah, like with a broken back, a little pot belly. Yeah. And every time you touch a gun, someone's like, no, yeah. you turn up with a pen knife and shit. Yeah. But fucking hell, that's, that's, that's insane. But I can, I, I just, because everything you, you know, you only experience in life are a touch point. So I can just imagine the team, you know, that I, by day one when I first turned up to to, to Wass and Joe Worsey thought my, my name was Jonathan instead of James Haskell. <laughs> but I was too polite to fucking tell him. But for weeks, he was like, Jonathan, John, I had to go and say someone else. So I was going, tug their shirt. And I was like, mate, you couldn't tell Joe Worsey that my name's James, could you? Because is that, is that awkward? But I, so, Yeah, I know what you mean, though. Completely, isn't you it? You can't do it. And also, yeah. when you're, like, you're, you're a bit unsure of what you're doing. I can imagine you trying to grab a gun. Someone grabs it, you're like, yeah. fuck. And then you've got the old lender gun, which has got like a bent barrel, yeah. like a bit of shit going on. But you're young, right? 24 years yeah, old. That's you're really still young. fucking young. You don't know anything at 24. Nah, nah, and then you're just thrown into this like armory and like, yeah, yeah. Did luckily. You, when, I mean, did you not think about doing the SPS? Because I know obviously normally army go into SAS, but could mm. you, when you saw them with all their beers and the cool stuff, obviously SPS is, is because people like, you know, Annie McNabb and, and um, what's the other guy? Uh, Chris Ryan. Chris Ryan. Yeah, because he was, uh, which one? They were both Hereford. They yeah, were both Hereford, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, cause soldier, uh, what was the name of their book? Was it Bravo Two Zero? Bravo Two Zero and then Chris Ryan. Soldier was, that got away. Oh, was soldier it? got away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. left behind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. What well, I led to her, people try to leave like, behind. You hear, yeah, you hear the real stuff. I have like heard that. that. That's yeah, what I mean. Because, yeah, yeah. because again, interestingly, over the years, with our, uh, a lot of uh, SF guys really like rugby, and it's quite quite a nice connection, mm. rugby and boxing and fighting, <laughs> bizarrely. Um, and it's interesting you hear things because we'll ask, you know, sit down, have a beer, and go. Was it? Yeah, it was Andy McNabb, the absolute boy, and all that. Was Chris? And they were like, mm, Andy McNabb was okay. Chris Ryan would pretty much get shot by his own side. I think they left yeah. him there on purpose. It was, yeah. it was, it was interesting. Because there's um, <clears throat> one of the guys that was on that mission is still, or he still does work with the regiment. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, if you, you hear about if you're it? Getting pissed and ask him, like he'll he'll tell you all. He'll, he'll oh tell really? You everything about it. What yeah. do you think of Bear Grylls? Um, oh, he's a good dude. Like he's. Do you know what? Again, he's like getting people into the outdoors yeah. and he's putting out a good message. Yeah. He's been super successful with it. Yeah, but he wasn't real SAS, was he? No, he's 2-1. Oh, 
Right. Yeah, so that's like, like support regiment. Reserve, isn't it? yeah, reserves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I remember. I just remember because it's one of those things that people go, God, I was in the SAS. What was that last bit you said? Yeah. Like, yeah. Reserves. You're like, well, well that's, you, you like, I don't know, you probably find that people that, like the Walter Mitties or yeah. the people that have never been in are more likely to be like in a bar saying, yeah, I was in the fucking SAS yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. What, the, mate, Whereas the Walter, we're just like, yeah, I'm in the you would, military. Yeah you, wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't admit it. Yeah. I, I do find that, that, you know, that, I mean, I remember a lot of players go, uh, I, I go out on, uh, to an event, someone goes, "Oh, my um, my mate's kid plays for for Was. Who's telling me? You're like, really? What's his name? And like, like Terry Evans. You're like, don't yeah. know, mate. He goes, no, he, he says in the first team. He's like, then it makes you look like you're fake. Yeah. Because I'm like, no, I'm in the first. He's like, well, no, he says he's. I'm yeah. like, I'm fucking telling you, love. He isn't <laughs> anywhere near it. And then you, and then next time, if you ever go back, and I go, I told you, wasn't it? Like, oh no, he turns out he was an academy. He's a regional academy. Yeah, player. yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah, it's the same. It's the same fucking thing. Yeah. And and do you know what? Like probably with rugby, it's like the special forces world is fucking tiny. Yes. Like everyone knows everyone, and if you don't, like you know someone that knows them. So if someone says, "Oh, do you know such and such a body?" Yeah. And you're like, "What squadron was he in?" B squadron. And you're like, "Never fucking." Heard yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, sorry, I didn't. I, I, I never got you to answer. So you didn't think about SPS, no? Um, nah, like didn't enter my head. Um, not just because it, it was just the done thing. Like you're in the paras, you go to the SAS. Um, Does anyone ever go across? The- yeah, you get occasional. Like you get people that that cross pollinate and and go either way. But, oh really? Well, a lot of uh, Marines are going over to the SAS now. Oh right, okay. Um, and you get there's probably about two or three powers that went over to the SBS. It's um, it, I don't know. It's just it's just the way it's always been, kind of thing. And then, do you think that when you got put into that mountain troop, that you know, how quickly did you realise you actually enjoyed what you were doing? Um, straight away, you know, like because you know, I told you I, I bust my back up. So yeah. I was I was climbing like for my rehab because it's quite it builds up a body strength, builds grip strength, and I'm moving in such a way that my back's moving and getting strength and i'm hanging so the the back's loosening so i started climbing started learning it one of the mountain guides that worked in the troop he was taking me away to climb um and then yeah like literally two months later went skiing and uh, did you ever ski before never skied in my life didn't get any lessons literally turned up all, with all the troop then my back was still bad at the same time and like uh the two two the team leader at the time was like, yeah, don't worry about it. He's like, just some of the lads will teach you. Went up to like top of a black run. Everyone just went. Pew! And I was just like, what the fuck? Like just try like, like Bambi on ice, literally just trying to like roll down to like catch up to the other lads, get down. And all the lads would just be like, for fuck's sake, you know, like this new bloke just like. Really? And not yeah. one, no one tried to help you? Towards the end of the day. Mate. Well, I... <laughs> it would, do you know what? Cause like that again, 24 years old, super naive, like, that was normal. I thought that was normal. So, you know, when, like, even now skiing and everyone goes on about a black run or something, yeah. I've never, like, looked at the colours. Right. Because, like, my first runs were, like, down these, like, <laughs> black runs. I've never been skiing. I know I sound like right. super middle class. Like, it's something that I would do. Yeah, yeah. I've never been. And I've actually got no interest in doing it. Yeah. Apparently, it's amazing, though. Yeah, it's good fun. Like, again, it's one of those things, if you're really good at it, you can max. So, did you get quite bad at it? I suppose mm. the nature of what you did. Yeah, like, um, so... Probably about uh, six years into being in the SAS, I went away to Germany and uh, trained to be a mountain guide with the Germans. Uh, so lived over there in the Alps for two years and literally just skied and climbed for, for two years. Did you ever ski off a mountain like James Bond and a, and a, and a uh, Union Jack fl- uh, parachute came out? So yeah. No. <laughs> Do you not? <laughs> nah. I'd, I'd, I'd want to like get a refund on some of this time in the SAS. Cause it's not, <laughs> I'd go to my like, CEO and be like, can we, what's fucking happening, man? I've done nothing. <laughs> What's, can you tell, what's the most badass thing you've done? Is there anything um, like ridiculous, like, you know, fired a, driven a car out of a, a no, Chinook, firing a machine gun wall? No, nah, because it's all like, you, you, at the end of the day, you've got to get everyone to the to yeah. the target to do the operation in the best condition possible. Right. I think like night jumping is probably one of the scariest. Yeah, because you're, um, you're uh, certified as a halo, or like an expert yeah, in halo so, jumping. Yeah, free High altitude, and, low opening, is that right? Yeah, but like high altitude, high opening, and high altitude, low opening. Um so like you qualify as like twenty five thousand feet with oxygen at night, full kit, um, which isn't too bad. Free falls, free falls, quite easy. It's um, so when you jump out, so the the hey ho, so jump out of the plane, parachute opens. Trying to do that with like twelve people in the air in like complete like blackness where there's no moon state is like that's fucking scary. Really? Yeah, because you've got. <laughs> 
because some people are shit at it as well. So like, if you're stood in front, if you're stood like in front of someone who you know is like terrible under canopy, and you're just like, fuck's sake. Um, <laughs> Do you go, shit, lads, got to go to the bathroom and try and, like, yeah. get out of uh, have out no line. choice. As soon as that light comes on, you jump But do you tell the them? Do you ever go, like, because for, you know, like, if, for a game in a, in a change room, we might be like, listen, you've got your role today, like, I need you to do this. Do you ever go, listen, Terry, <laughs> you're fucking oh, gash, bro. Just <laughs> yeah. don't, like, don't go anywhere, like, sort it out today. Do they yeah. know? Because I, I, the reason I, I wondered about that, because of just, being surrounded by the, the head, the top of your game, surely make you want to be, you know, even better every day. Yeah, do you, but do you know what? Like some things, parachuting, people are, you're either good at it, you're okay at it, and some people just can't get it. Right. Some people are like, doesn't matter who you are, some people just get really nervous under canopy. I don't, I don't even know what it is because you're not with them when they're jumping. So it's, you know, and, and the thing is like the room for error is massive. Like if you have a collision at night time and he wraps your... So like your parachute's mm. on your back. If he wraps you up in his, his rigging lines, which has happened, he can cut away. Sorry, you can... Oh, no, he can cut away. But if you're wrapped up, you've literally got to ride your parachute down. And if he's tangled it up, you could be falling like faster. There's so much that could go wrong. And it's pitch black and you can't see the ground. Like we've had guys like break ankles on, on impact. And like it's, it's dangerous. And especially like if, if that happens... So if you're quite high in the air, you've got time to sort it out. You've got a knife. You can start cutting rigging lines, all that kind of stuff. And if you do, if that happens on like you know, hundred foot in the air, you're pretty much fucked. Like you're you're hitting that ground, and if you know, if you don't break it, like breaking something, it'd be like a positive. You know, death yeah. would probably be the worst thing that could happen to you. Or possibly the best thing in the state you would be if you did hit the ground. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Because the getting injured um, really affect you. Because of what you did. Um, yeah, but again, do you know what? I was quite young, like the back slip. Like I've not really had many major injuries. If anything, it's just general wear and tear. Um, like the back injury wasn't too bad because I was 24 years old, right? Like um, it, you know, I could, could still carry on doing what I did. I still got paid because I was in the military. Um, but I can't imagine, you know, if I was injured now, I think it'd be a lot worse. Um, yeah, I mean, you must have had some serious injuries. In yeah, I, I, well, actually, touch wood, I was okay. I mean, I've now got wear and, wear and tear. I've got three yeah. I've got three bulging discs in my back. I've got arthritis in my ankle. I need shoulder surgery. My, fi my fingers look like a set of Allen keys. I, so there's bits and pieces that have, have, have fallen off. But I didn't have any... I mean, I had, the worst injury I had was I, I ruptured my big toe joint. I mean, David Hay made like toe injuries quite uncool. You know, the boxer. <laughs> Vladimir Klitschko. You know, he said after Vladimir Klitschko fight. You know, do you ever see it? Remember, yeah. so he fought Vladimir Klitschko and just didn't fire a punch. And throw a punch, and um, and uh, and then afterwards he said he'd broken his little toe. Yes, I remember. And, but he had, yeah, he had yeah, actually. Yeah. I know it was actually, and obviously you know it affects your balance. Of course, big toe. but people don't give a shit right about that. That, that yeah. you know, it was just an excuse. Like you should never have said anything. With my toe, I, I you know I, I, I tore all the ligaments, did everything, had to have um, a piece of bone removed, and uh, only because Under Armour sent me a boot that was size and a half smaller, and they were NFL that they were so solid, I was able to get two more years out of my career. I should have, no I should way. have retired. Yeah. So now. You know, now with my a bad ankle on one side, toe on the other, I, you know, I'm very envious with, that you've moved. You know, that you've done one thing, moved on to something else, to kind of have the your full fitness. I can't, I can't run anymore. How old are you? Thirty five. Fuck. I know. Yeah, yeah. I know can you, you do anything? I only look Twenty one. Can you do anything? <laughs> Mate, well, fucking. You know, <laughs> like, I'm that. I'm that idiot doing bicep do curls. Yeah. No. So I, I, um, I was doing, I was doing the MMA stuff. And obviously in lockdown, yeah, so I, was like, I was like the back, and the, yeah. how's that all affected? Well, because I was because I was in the the you know you know when you're in the on the treadmill uh, of of in and out of training doing stuff, yes. your body adapts. Yeah. When you stop, that's where it's lethal. Yeah. So in lockdown, I was great. I, even though I started training, but things like my ankle got way worse, my back played up, and and because I wasn't in the training and actually because you're doing more sitting. That fucked it. So what I've now gone it, it gone is my next goal because I think everybody needs a goal is just uh, to be pain free. Yeah. To try and you know so I've got like I've just do had you any yoga? I'm, do you know what I'm I'm actually starting with a mobility cut. <laughs> <Burping. Burping. laughs> <laughs> that fizzy <laughs> water. Yeah. Um, I thought, like, ah, what's I thought, that? I thought it's my breath really that bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I. Um, it, my goal now is is I, I need a goal, you know, and I and I you know I want to talk to you about some of yours now moving forward. Is that 
mine is just to be pain free to get back to start doing some stuff. I want to get a black belt in jujitsu. That's mm -hmm. what I want to do. I'd like to start doing a bit more boxing sparring. I want to, you know, but I've got to be really careful. I'm never going to be able to run again. I yeah. don't think that's not going to be able to happen. Um, you know, I, I would love to do some challenges. Like I was actually talking to talking to my agent about doing some challenges, about doing something, maybe trying to climb something or do something, which I, but I, again, until I do it, I don't know what state my body's in, but I have to at least two or three times a week put myself into a hole, versa climber, mm -hmm, ski mm -hmm. erg, do something. But I miss, I miss the old, you know, push a prowler, tire flips, burpees, but which I'm just not sure I can do at the moment, unfortunately. Really? Yeah. See, I'm, a, I'm exactly the same. <clears throat> you know, when you said about if, like, because I started doing loads of endurance stuff recently, completely dropped all the weights. I was doing, like, high mileages on the bike, going out for 20-mile runs, like, loving it, you know, getting mm. back into the endurance, but stopped doing weightlifting. My back, fuck, like, slipped again. Like, savage. Like, you know, I was waking up in the morning, like, my leg was just, like, the sciatica was going down. It was, like, so painful. Mm. Like, I was limping. I'd have to go for, like, an hour walk in the morning to, like, actually limber <laughs> up. Um Honestly, do you know what I did? I just started deadlifting again and just started lifting weight. Not heavy, but just that uh, motion of just lifting weight and just getting underweight, and, and it's gone now. It's literally took about three or four weeks, and it's gone. And also, does anybody want the endurance, you know, endurance yeah, athlete this, this is another Do thing. Do you want that? That, and it's pretty useless, right? Yeah, it is. Like, or I think the extremes are useless. Yes. Like, trying to, you know, deadlifting 500 kg. Are you ever going to do that no. in real life? running an ultra marathon. 100 miles now, like you've got to strike a balance yeah. between them ideally being able to run sort of like you know pretty consistently maybe for an hour might be quite a nice thing to have and sprint might, and sprint yeah run, you, like you need to sprint right yeah this is what we did when like back in, in in the special forces it was like you know towards the end of my time we had guys come in and go right what does this this is an athlete what does he need to be able to do and it was like right he needs to um, sprint for short periods of time but still have some sort of endurance be able to carry kit be able to generate power to like you know smash doors open yeah. with bits of kit you know be able, be able to have the endurance to do all that do you know it was like do and you, that's very much in real life isn't it it's like you need a bit yeah. of all that kind of stuff do you see people because there's a guy at the gym I train at who's obviously trying to go into some sort of army thing because he trains in army gear it's fucking. You couldn't make it out, right? Like what? What's so, he so he wears like, army boots. He's not trying to go in the army. He's wearing he, army boots. He, he wants people to ask. Right. Him he's, he's wearing army boots and uh, he wears combat trousers, and tight vest. He's got dog tags on. No chance. <laughs> no, no, no. Sounds like he sounds like he's in a, a gay dancing. Yeah, band a or pain, pain. <laughs> he he. So I I I. But he's like he trains real you know real hard. So my only thought is that he's trying to train as if he. Is if it, you know, just to like in conditions because nah. you know, there's like, no point I, running in beautiful running shoes, you've got to run in boots. Surely you would want to start training in boots. Yeah, no, like when you turn up to join any military unit, they're going to teach you everything anyway. Yeah. So they're not just, you're not going to turn up and they go, right, we're doing 10 miles in boots today. Yeah. It's going to be like, right, they're going to start you running in trainers and then they're going to move you to boots and then they're going to add weight. I saw a guy training the other day and he was like, um, you know, in between doing electric guitar. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? He used, he used to be a guy at my gym. Um, Definitely on the juice. Yeah. And he used to, his warm up was on a treadmill and he'd start like doing like flying knees and stuff. Oh, and, like, yeah. Elbows yeah, on the yeah, treadmill yeah. and stuff. And he wore one of those string vests. Yeah. yeah. Nips out. Yeah. Nips yeah. out like a set of like bright leggings and he'd be like, hmm. <laughs> yeah. Massive headphones like the ones we're wearing now. Yeah. Just like, what are you doing? Like, I know. I probably just... never stepped foot in, a, in an nah. MMA gym or a kickboxing nah. gym. And, all, and my best thing is all the, is, is, is like all the people, especially the women, like their handbag weighs like 12 kgs and they've got twos and they're like, yeah, yeah, you're like, yeah. Love, your handbag weighs more than the weights you're using. Yeah. Why, why don't you just fucking go up to 12s? That Selfridges bag that they had at the weekend yeah. probably weighed way more. And I saw, I saw one woman say, go on, a, go on the, the chest press machine. She just flumped down. I was like this. With no weight. And I was yeah. like, watch. And I was like, you're honestly doing nothing. Yeah. Were you surprised at how you got through selection? And, and what were the key things you found out about yourself doing it? Um... Do you know what? Like a, a little bit, but I guess it's one of those things, right? Selection six months and you start it. And, you know, I remember driving up to the camp, uh, to the camp at Sennybridge where you start. And, um, you know, it was slightly nervous. Like I turned around to my mate, Joe, and just went like, what the fuck are we doing? And we just laughed. Did you know that nervous, yeah, yeah. expel yeah. of nervous also, It's energy. like nervous, but also like, <laughs> you've got yeah, gagging yeah, yeah. every yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. horrible, feeling. mate. And um, it's like anything. I think anticipation is worse than when you actually start. And, one, you know, once you start... <clears throat> once you started selection it was it's, it's that you know you 
you put the SAS on a pedestal, but actually when you start doing it every day is just like another day. You wake up, you do your thing, you go to sleep, you wake up, you do your thing. And then you don't realize that at the end of that six months you've of what you've achieved almost. So, um, yeah, like I didn't, I didn't really think that, what was the question? I forgot the question. <laughs> I just, I, I, I said, you know, did, were you surprised that you got through selection and what yeah. did you learn about yourself doing it? Yeah. Do, do you know what? I think you just learn like resilience. So you learn that you, you can put yourself through these situations and then, and then do you know what? You, you realize that selection is just scratching the surface and actually the difficult stuff, difficult stuff comes afterwards. So it, it, it becomes even harder once you come out of that. Yeah, of course. That's just a test, right? To get you through, to say that this guy is able to serve in a, a saber squadron. But then, do you know, like when you're fucking in Afghanistan and you've had no sleep and you're back to back targets and you're carrying a shitload of kit and you've run out of water and you need to extract 10 miles to a HLS and you've just been in a heavy contact. Like, that's fucking harder than any, yeah. any day that you get in selection. Did you ever think when you were doing that and, and in those situations that you would be about to release a book, you would have been on a TV show, hanging out with absolute heroes like John, me, Johnny. absolute Johnny, Johnny Hask, <laughs> absolute boy. Did you, did you? Nah. Nah. nah Are you we... surprised about how it's gone? Yeah, yeah. Like, do, do you know what? Like, I talk about it, talk about it in the book and it's like opportunity seeking and I've always been... I've always been open to to opportunity and just always seized it and done what's felt right for me at the time. And, you know, when I left the military um, in 2008, I wanted to leave. Like, I felt like I'd done a lot of what I wanted to do when I was in the SAS. So now I was almost just marking time and just trying to increase, like, get a higher rank. And It's amazing you felt that you had done that you'd done enough because I, I would have thought with you guys it's a never-ending pursuit of like the next high the next achievement where can i where can i go yeah no like i mean most operations are still the same right and you train 90 percent and then 10 percent operations and operations are like where it you know what everyone looks forward forward to and you know that that you know that was changing and turning into a different thing and we were doing different things operationally so um, the rest of it's still the same, going on going on the range, shooting guns, like jumping out of planes, all that kind of stuff remains the same. So for me, like I found the mountain stuff and that was a bit of an eye opener for me to say, right, there's there's more that I want to explore in the world. Um, so when I left, I felt good about leaving. I was, you know, ready to leave. It was the right thing to do. Um, and then, yeah, the rest has just been like a bit of a roller coaster, you know? And, and what did climbing Everest compare like to selection of those bits because for some people it, it, they fall apart and it's horrific and it just the strain it puts on your body everyone sees kind of the the end result but doesn't see how many people fail to do it or where they get to yeah like do you know like Everest gets a lot of slagging in the press and like by climbers but it's still like one of the hardest things that I've done and you know it's six weeks living on a mountain like limited oxygen like shit food um and yeah you come back like a, a like selection a skinny run um Again, like climbing Everest was a little bit like being badged for SAS. It's a bit of an anticlimax, and... it's, but it's just it's just a piece of it's like a piece of land. Yeah, yeah. You just stood on a piece of land, and it's the same thing, isn't it? Everyone puts Everest on a pedestal, and it's like, fuck Mount Everest. It's the biggest mountain in the world, but when you stood on it, it's just it's just a bit of snow. What did you? What have you learned about your motivations for doing what you do? What is it like? You want to be the one guy in the room that's is this ticked all the boxes like me you've got stories to tell or is it you just want to make use of your bodies and skill both I'd say both like as, as cliche as it is like we get one life don't we and yeah. it's like i want to do things that i like that's wealth for me right is like be surrounded by fucking awesome individuals that inspire me do things that feel good and that i get satisfaction from um yeah and just just live a good life in terms of um some of the lessons that you obviously had in regards to, to to your team, what what was the most profound stuff you had you had you you found out about working in such tight knit teams? Was it was it was it feedback? Was it communication? Was it honesty? What, what was it all of them together? I think you just learn a lot, right, from working, especially in high stress environments like like with the rugby. It's the same, isn't it? You go out, you do your stuff. It's you forge the best friendships and relationships. Um, and do you know what? There's like so many like valuable lessons that you could pull out from that but i think just you know the experience of of working with a diverse group of individuals and just just understanding how that works 
and how that and, and and you know understanding how you can make that better and how you can all you know work towards achieving the same thing do you notice the difference between your your fellow colleagues and their desire to get better and honest and feedback and then working with people in the real world and how that that doesn't that doesn't happen yeah yeah but then do you know what like i work for myself like i've not got a nine to five job like I, all my mates are the same it's like all my mates are doing their own thing they're all you know none of them have a nine to five job they can all like if they want to go out on the piss on a fucking Monday night, they can and not wake up on a Tuesday kind of thing. It's like, it's like I surround myself by those kind of people and whether that's ex special forces guys or just people that are doing that kind of stuff. Um, so they inspire me and just keep me going. Do you ever have any, any emotional hangovers from, from doing what you did? Do you, do you ever, you miss that or do you ever suffer any, cause it's interesting when I, when we did the stuff with the SPS, I spoke to a few of the guys and I was like, do you speak to psychologists? Do you talk to people? And they went, no, we just sit around a fire, have a few beers, debrief and, and that's us. Yeah. <clears throat> I think like, you know, the whole mental health thing's probably taking a change now. And I don't know when it was when you went in, went back to a pool, pool with the SPS lads. Um, personally, I don't like, I've always been quite, fo quite fortunate. Like, yeah, like I probably get periods in my life where I'm a little bit more depressed. Maybe that's cause, I've not been on an expedition for a while or something's not going right my way, but it's generally relatable to something. So I can sit back and go, do you know what? I'm feeling depressed probably because I've not been outside my house all day. Or, do you know, like <laughs> I you, can... you lived outdoors. <laughs> yeah, that's why. Right, <laughs> no. fine. Um, but now, like I've touched wood, I've always been pretty decent with, with mental health. And I think that, you know, that's, you know, that's changing now massively for, for men, you know, um, you know, you look at like, the rate of male suicides like yeah. massively on the up and because it's interesting because if you I know obviously you're you're bound by the, the the secrets act and and various other things so being able to express yourself is hard but I I would have thought for for most people the ultimate pinnacle of manliness is special forces guys if you guys talk about your stuff because I was astounded that you guys didn't speak to, I've always spoke to spoke to a sports psychologist but it was always about performance or was like dealing with criticism or dealing with shit coaches or shit selection and, and how to manage that and how to get the best out of myself not you know I've you know I've got anxiety I've got whatever but I just wondered what you got whether that had changed now whether you'd ever thought how important it was it, it is changed like the culture's changing right because the culture wasn't there in the past so it was you know if you felt yourself having like PTSD or like you were having flashbacks about an incident that happened generally people would bottle that up right whereas now i think post afghanistan because you had all these cases of ptsd and mental yeah. health problems were coming out um you know that culture's changed people feel you, freer to speak about it yeah and i also think like going back to what you were saying about the psychologist thing like that's changing a lot now and you know the sas or the special forces is you, you know it's it's always been about <clears throat> like like working hard on the ranges working hard uh doing the drills that you need to do and we kind of forgot about the person and the individual. Whereas now, you know, I was talking before about getting top sports people in to, to coaches. I know they're getting like, um, like, I don't know, like people like Eddie Jones comes yeah. in and talks and like, you're getting all these like, um, so, like psychologists and stuff like that come in and just and talk about that stuff. Um, Cause it's interesting. Cause I would have thought as, you know, you guys are almost, you know, trained machines on every aspect. The ones aspect that so many people neglect and I talk about it in what a flanker in sport is that the mental side if I said to you mm -hmm. listen you you know you're gonna if you if I give you the best equipment it's gonna help you see in the dark if I said to you you know uh you need to be this fit to do it you go and do it or wear these trainers or wear this hat you know it's gonna fucking help you keep your head warm you do it but if I said by the way you can improve everything about your life you sat down and spoke to someone and addressed it so many people just don't do it mm. it's, it's it's the most bizarre thing yeah it, yeah no, I agree. Who's this guy I'm going to speak to? By the way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, reason, the reason I was looking Send at him, you, Send me his number. You literally he needs, need, he you, needs this guy. Uh, I, I just, when he came in, I was like, mentally weak. <laughs> first note. First, first no. But it is, no, it's weird. It's like, um, well, it's not weird, but going back to that, it you know, it's a different culture, isn't it? And yeah. You only get 24 hours in a day and you can only fit so much training and, and, and all that kind of stuff in a day. And I think, you know, everything's changing now and we are becoming a bit more savvy to... Um, to you know mental performance and all that kind of stuff um you know personally for me it's a massive thing and i've never you know touch wood like i said no dramas with mental health and you will do after this interview yeah flashbacks <laughs> i give a lot of people the depression <laughs> <laughs> he's talking to me again yeah. um what can what can people expect from your book when it's out uh so soldiers a book about um so my life essentially it is 
kind of how I've took my life from the start. So from being born in Preston, you know, as a kid, and then that's also kind a of massive a, handicap as well, isn't it? it massive. Impressive, yeah. massive, that's why I've never gone back. Yeah. But you know, now you know to where I've got to now, and I've just kind of dissected it and just gone right. Well, it's all about being a soldier, and you know, these are the qualities that that it it takes to be a you know a special forces soldier. How can I explain that to to everyone? And, and talk about my life at the same time. I want to give them lessons for them to take into their own lives and so much. Completely, some yeah. Fine. Like this is this is what it takes to be a special forces soldier. This is it in, in layman's terms. Read it and you can apply it to your life, whatever you do. Mate, it's been so kind to have you on on board. Thank you so much for coming down. Hopefully you don't feel it was a wasted trip. I we've been talking for just over an hour and it felt like we were talking yeah, for ten yeah. minutes. I feel like we just started. So I'm a bit concerned that we might not cover covered anything. We've just talked utter crap. But if we haven't and people get some value, will you come on again? 100%. Because we can delve into a bit more. Um, yeah. Also, because I want to read your book as well. Um, as I said, because you know I've got the utmost respect for you guys, and I think. Um, you know, I think it's amazing what you what you've done. You know, to, to climb Everest, to spend that time at the top of your game, to develop, and I wish you the best of luck in your in your latest endeavours. Awesome, cheers. Where can people follow you on on social media? Uh, yeah, Instagram's probably the best one. So J underscore or double underscore Morton, uh, Twitter and Facebook. Same and, same. And Jay's sort of like um, at Middleton, but more sensible and um, not it's not as mad. I'm not a scientist. And he's not a scientist. <laughs> Who could beat, beat COVID uh, single-handedly? Um, thanks so much, guys, for listening to What a Flank. I'm James Haskell. Uh, please subscribe, please share, please recommend it to friends. If you don't like it, still recommend it. Thank you.